In this lecture, we will discuss the epidemiology and management of fungal infection in critically ill patients. And the objectives of this lecture is to discuss what is the epidemiology of the fungal infection in the ICU, what is the pathophysiology and risk factors, and what are the management strategies. And we'll start by discussing four different cases. Case number one, 30 year old female patient, history of acute lymphoplastic leukemia on chemotherapy, Emergency laboratory revealed a perforation of mid sigmoid colon and fecal peritonitis, and total leukocytic count is 300. And the patient now has septic shock, broad spectrum antibiotic was started, and the question is should we add antifungal for this patient or not? And the second case is 25 year old male patient, history of renal transplant one year ago. Patient was admitted to the ICU with a clinical picture of the urinary tract infection. Ultrasound revealed obstructive hydronephrosis and double J was inserted. And the current status of this patient, the total excited count is 12,000. The patient has septic shock and again the broad spectrum antibiotic was started and the question is should we add antifungal for this patient or not. The third case, 25 year old male patient, history of appendectomy three days ago. Patient was admitted to the ICU with a clinical picture of the septic shock Exploration revealed duodenal perforation. And in this case, the total leukocytic count is 25,000. Patient on mechanical ventilation and the broad spectrum antibiotic was started. And again, should we add antifungal for this patient or not? And in the last case, we have 35 year old female patient. Patient was admitted to the ICU with head trauma and disturbed conscious level. Patient intubated and mechanically ventilated. Chest X-ray revealed pictures suggestive of pneumonia. Three days later, the sputum was sent for analysis, and the sputum culture is positive for candida. And the question again, should we add antifungal for this patient or not? And we started by asking, what is the prevalence of the fungal infection in the ICU? And in this study, try to estimate the burden of fungal infection in Italy. Every year we have 3,749 fungal infections in the ICUs. Most of these infections are candida infection. And in EPIC-2 study, which is the largest study worldwide and include 14,000 patients, 51% of this patient has an infection. And as we see here, the candida constitute 17% of the infection in the our worldwide, which ranked the third after gram-positive and gram-negative infection. And the rank of the candida in the bloodstream infection is different in the United States than the European based study. In the United States, the rank of the candida is the third or fourth among isolated pathogens. However, in the European countries, the rank of the candida is the sixth to the tenth among isolated pathogens. But globally, the invasive candidiasis ranges from the one to the ten per one thousand ICU admission. And as we see here, the mortality with the candida in healthcare setting is high. Whether the candida is isolated from the internal medicine department, oncology department, or ICU department. So we have three facts about the epidemiology of the fungal infection in the ICU. The fact number one is the fungal infection is common in ICU. The fact number two, the candida is the most common fungal pathogens in critically ill patients. It constitutes 80% of the fungal infection. And the fact number three, the candida infection is associated with a high risk of mortality. But what is the pathophysiology and risk factor for fungal infection? And there are many risk factors for fungal infection in the ICU like diabetes, renal failure, major trauma, parenteral nutrition, immunosuppression, multiple transfusion, ICU stay more than seven days, and vascular catheter. But the question is, are all patients at the same risk of disease if they are exposed to the same risk factors? And there are four components of the mucosal barrier against fungal infection. The first barrier is the mechanical barrier, which depends on the intact mucosal layer. And the second barrier is the chemical barrier, like gastric acid or digestive enzymes. And the third barrier is the immune barrier, which depends on the presence of the macrophage and plasma cells. And the fourth barrier is the microbial barrier, which depends on the presence of the commensal bacteria like lactobacillus. And the candida need to be colonized on the surface to be changed from the yeast form 
to the hyphae form and when the change of the hyphae form it can invade the body so the ICU stay more than seven days is very important risk factor that allows some time for colonization and to answer the question are all patients at the same risk with the disease if they are exposed to the same risk factors for the case number one this patient has a perforation in the gut and the total exit count is 300 so this patient has a problem in the mechanical barrier and in the immune barrier and for the case number two this patient has renal transplant one year ago so most probably this patient has a problem in the immune barrier and for case number three this patient has a duodenal perforation and most probably mechanical barrier is disrupted and for case number four the all barriers are intact so the answer to this question is probably not all the patient at the same risk with the disease and we should consider the underlying condition of the patient when thinking about the management but how can we diagnose the invasive candle infection in the ICU and in general there are four facts about the diagnosis of the candida the fact number one the clinical differentiation between colonized and the infected patient is difficult the fact number two the clinical signs of invasive candidiasis are identical to those of other nosocomial bacterial infection the fact number three the cultures other than the blood are not specific and last fact there is no single test is available to make straightforward diagnosis and because the diagnosis of the candida is not straightforward we usually use several tools like colonization index candida score and biomarkers and we started by colonization index and the idea behind the colonization index that the, when the patient is exposed to the multiple risk factors like multiple antibiotics vascular access or icu stay more than seven days this increase the burden of the colonization of the yeast on the surface and in excess colonization the yeast change it to from the yeast form to the hyphae form and when change of the hyphae form this followed by invasion to the body and in this study, 650 surgical ICU patients followed for six months, 29 patients colonized by candida species, 18 patients are just colonized, and 11 patients changed from their colonized form to the true candida infection. And usually the duration from the change from the colonized to the true candida infection about five to six days. The colonization index is the ratio of the number of the non-blood body sites colonized by the candida to the total number of the body sites cultured. So if we're dividing the number of the colonized site by the number of the tested site, and this number more than 0.5, this means that the risk of the candidemia is high. The second score is the candida score. And the candida score includes four variables. The clinical sepsis takes two points, total parental nutrition, recent surgery, and multifocal candida colonization, each item takes one point. And if the candida score more than 2.5, the risk of candidemia is high. And in both colonization index and the candida score, the negative predictive value are higher than the positive predictive value. This means that the colonization index less than 0.5 or the candida score less than 3, we can rule out the candida infection. And lastly, the biomarkers. And the biomarkers include mannan antigen, mannan antibody, BD glucan, and the candida albicans germy tube antibody or cacti. And both mannan and BD glucan are components of the cell wall of the candida. And this meta analysis evaluated the use of the mannan antigen and anti mannan antibody in the diagnosis of the invasive candidiasis. And as we see here, the diagnostic odds ratio for mannan antigen only is 18, and for anti-mannan antibody is 12. But if we combine both mannan and anti-mannan antibody, the diagnostic odds ratio increased to 58. So the best result is to combine both mannan antigen and anti-mannan antibody to diagnose invasive candidiasis. And for the BDD glucan, the best cutoff value is 80 picogram per milliliter which have a positive and negative predictive value higher than the candida score and the colonization index. And most important question, when should I treat this patient? And we typically give antifungal agent if the infection is proven or as a prophylaxis or as an empirical therapy. Proven means that we have a positive blood culture. 
positive blood culture in the blood is unlikely to be contaminant and should always be considered true fungemia. And we used antifungal as a prophylaxis if we only have excess risk factor, but all clinical signs, biomarkers, and cultures are negative. But which patient will get benefit from prophylaxis approach? And we have two guidelines for diagnosis and management of candida infection. One of them is from European Society of Clinical Microbiology Infectious Disease published in 2012, and the other one from the Infectious Disease Society of America published in 2016. And in both guidelines, they recommend that the prophylaxis should be restricted to the high risk group, which is defined as recent abdominal surgery plus recurrent gastrointestinal perforation or selected cases of liver transplant. And the empirical therapy is defined as we will start antifungal agent if the patient have excess risk factor, have a clinical sign of infection, the biomarker may be positive or negative, but the culture is negative. And there are several approaches to start empirical therapy. One of them has been published in Intensive Care Medicine Research Agenda on Invasive Fungal Infection in Critically Ill Patients. And in this approach, we will start by asking what is the type of the patient. If the patient has abdominal surgery with anastomotic leakage, we will start antifungal therapy. But if the patient have, is medical or have non-abdominal surgery or have abdominal surgery with no leakage, we will assess for the risk factors. If the patient have a multiple risk factors, we will calculate either colonization index or candida score. If the colonization index is less than 0.5 or candida score less than 3, we will follow up the patient. But if the colonization index is more than 0.5 or candida score more than 3, we will start antifungal therapy. Then we will ask for biomarkers. If the biomarkers is positive, we will continue antifungal therapy. But if the biomarker is negative, we will discontinue the antifungal therapy. But how should we select the antifungal therapy? And typically, we have four types of antifungal therapy. Echinocandins, which inhibit BD glucansal wall. Azoles, which inhibit ergosterol synthesis. Poline, which inhibit the cell wall synthesis. And finally, flocytosine, which is metabolized to the 5 fluorouracil There are several factors to determine how to select the antifungal therapy, which include hemodynamic of the patient, prevalence of the candida species, presence of the biofilm, and the site of the infection. So if the patient is hemodynamic unstable or has septic shock, it's better to start echinocandins. And the second thing that determines the type of the antifungal agent is the type of the candida species. If the prevalence of the candida gabbrata is high, the best choice is the echinocandins. However, if the candida parapsilosis is the predominant, the echinocandins will be resistant. And the biofilm occurs when the candida creates three-dimensional matrix, and usually it occurs with a medical device like a pacemaker. And in case we suspect biofilm, we should use either high dose of echinocandins or amphotericin B, but we should not use fluconazole. And the site of infection is also important. For example, there is poor penetration of the echinocandins in the brain, in the eye, and in the urinary system. And we can use this stepwise approach to select antifungal agent. The first question will be if the patient is hemodynamically unstable or not. If the patient is stable, we will ask if there is any previous use of azole or not. The next question will be if there is any excess of candida glabrata in the intensive care unit. And the last question will be if there is any increased excess infection with biofilm. If all these questions will be answered by no, we can use fluconazole. But if any of these questions would be answered by yes, we'll see if there is any excess colonization by candida parapsilosis. If the answer is yes, we'll use amphotericin B, and if the answer is no, we'll use echinocandins. And we can summarize the antifungal agent according to the site of infection by the following diagram. If you have a CNS infection, the first line is the amphotericin B, and we can use fluconazole as step-down therapy. And if we have ocular infection, the first line will be fluconazole or voriconazole, and amphotericin B is used for resistant strain. And for central line infection, we use either echinocandins or amphotericin B, and we should remove the central line. We should not treat pulmonary candidiasis, and it should be considered as colonization.
and for cardiac device we should use either amphotericin B or high dose of echinocandas because of the presence of the biofilm and for esophageal candidiasis we use either oral fluconazole or IV fluconazole or echinocandins for those who are not tolerating oral and for urinary candidiasis for asymptomatic patient there is no treatment and for symptomatic patient we use fluconazole and we should remove any obstruction all the following patients with positive cultures need the following interventions. We should remove the central line and we should have a fundus examination because of high incidence of endothermitis. And we should do echocardiography to exclude vegetation. And lastly, we should continue antifungal agent 14 days after the first negative blood culture. Back to the, our cases. For the first case, should we add antifungal agent or not? Probably yes, because this patient at high risk of fungal infection. And the second case is also at high risk of fungal infection, and this is why we should add antifungal for this patient. And for the third case, although this patient is immunocompetent, but the duodenal perforation carry high risk of fungal infection. That's why we should add antifungal for this patient. In the last case, we don't need to add antifungal agent because this patient is immunocompetent and we shouldn't treat for pulmonary candidiasis. And thank you.